I'm so glad you're looking at this instead of listening. Ha! Wrong! You're listening instead of looking. Because it's too bright! It's too bright. And I'm probably going to fiddle with the camera a lot. Anyway, this is not something that you're going to expect from me. I am the guy who runs around saying Windows 11 must be stopped. I am the guy who says that Windows 11 is cancer. Its UI is cancer. Its recall feature is cancer. It's strict requirements that obsolete a bunch of older computers that are perfectly fine and serviceable are cancer. There's so much about Windows 11 that is cancer. I am also the first person to tell you Mac OS is fine, kinda, but the Mac hardware is cancer. So Mac OS is cancer because Mac hardware is cancer because it's non-upgradable, overpriced garbage. Now granted, it might be pretty, but it's still garbage. Look up Flexgate <laughs> if you want to know more about that. Um, or there was a video somewhere, I don't know if I posted it, where I had a brand new iMac, an M1 iMac, and I couldn't plug in the mouse that the guy brought me that was dead to charge it because it was lightning and all they had on the back of the Mac was USB-C ports. Hey guys, why can't you just make the mouse USB-C? Then I could use a standard cable, but no, Apple's got to be different. So yeah, Apple does stuff like that strictly for the reason uh, that they don't want to be compatible with other people because otherwise you won't buy their stupid lightning cable or whatever. But I digress. Uh, this rant on Linux being dead is not sponsored by Monster Energy. If you watched an old video of mine called Computer Tip, Slow Internet, or whatever, you know that I crashed my car while drinking this. And you totally won't die if you drink too much of this stuff. I love it. This video is sponsored by Monster Energy, reminding you that the red octagon means stop, you know! This video is sponsored by Monster Energy. Adrenal fatigue is totally not a thing. Or at least, that's something that I uh, made a joke about at the beginning. Anyway, that was a fun little bit. Today, no crashy car thing. Today, I'm going to crash your expectations because despite me saying Windows 11 is total hot garbage, despite me saying that Mac OS, because of the Mac ecosystem, is hot garbage, despite all of that, I'm here to tell you why Linux is dead. Linux has been dead. Linux died a long time ago. Now, you might be thinking, this is sensationalist BS. Come on, Jody, you're just pulling a clickbait. You're just trying to get that neato title thumbnail thing going to get people riled up so that they'll get all pissed off, click on your video, get butt mad, leave comments and engagement, and you can farm that for some sweet, sweet money. Yes, that is a thing that I am doing. But... That is not entirely what I'm doing. See, when I say that Linux is dead, I do not mean that you can't use it, that it will stop working. I don't mean any of that. What I mean is that Linux is too far into development as an overall system. I am not talking strictly about the kernel. I am talking about everything surrounding it. It is too far into the weeds to ever be recovered. This is something that I've been thinking a lot about lately as I've been doing more research for the UI documentary that I know, I know, it'll never come out at this rate, but hey man, I am still working on it. So, I've been doing research. Um, I've been looking into things like the ribbon that came out in Office 2007 that was controversial at the time, that I hated, that I have customers to this day that run Office 2003 on their Windows 11 machines because, because they, they don't like the ribbon. They hate it that much. And LibreOffice has a classic toolbar system that's very similar to Office 2003 and older. And LibreOffice is doing just fine. It's, there's, there's, no, there's no shortage of success for LibreOffice. I've seen a ton of people running it without me telling them about it. So, 
What do I mean when I say Linux is dead? Linux has long passed the point where it can become a viable system. And the reason is because if I say Linux, unlike Windows or Mac OS, <coughs> if I say Linux, I don't, you don't get enough information. There's just, there's nothing there. Linux, okay. Which one? Uh, well, it's not like Windows, you know, 7, 8, 8.1, 10, 11. It's not like Mac OS, uh, you know, 10.8, you know, 10.9, 10.13, 11.12, whatever. Because Linux is not a, a not, it's just not an operating system. It's a kernel. And it's used to describe whole systems built around this kernel. But it doesn't mean anything. And that is actually the primary problem with Linux. Its greatest strength is its greatest weakness. You've probably heard me say this before. The freedom that Linux gives you is also the thing that's responsible for it never succeeding in the desktop world. And I believe I've done a rant very similar to this, uh, primarily on user interface consistency. But it goes further than that. When you have a system that is monolithic, or no, monolithic is not really the right way to describe it, but when you take choices away from people and you're left with just one way of doing things, the downside is that you're left with one way of doing things, which means you don't have any other way to get something done. But the big upside to that is that standardizing on one way of doing things means that there's only one way that you have to worry about. It means that to develop software to do the one way of doing things is a lot faster. There are less cases you have to test for. There are less things you have to be compatible with. And I was thinking about it and I looked at some very old articles and comments and, uh, and, and this it just sort of hit me today and it's why I'm making this video. <clears throat> Take Windows File Explorer. Oh my God, a fairy, there's a fairy. Take Windows File Explorer. File Explorer is not, I wouldn't say that it is perfect because it is not. Um, if you compare File Explorer to some things that are available on other platforms, there are some features that would be very nice to have, but Windows File Explorer does not have it. We used to just call it Windows Explorer back in my day, you darn kids, damn okay Zoomers. But here's the thing about Windows File Explorer that, and, and even Mac OS in a way has the same advantage. It is a standard. It is the one way of doing things. It is designed to be extendable. And it is very flexible and capable and powerful even when all it is, is a dialog box to go find stuff in another program. <clears throat> so if you ever used GIMP on Windows, you know that the file chooser dialog for GIMP on Windows is the GTK file chooser dialog. The GTK dialog is not a standard Windows dialog box. It does not work the same way. It does not look the same. It is a very different looking beast. It doesn't, you know, none of your Windows sensibilities carry into it. But it's perfectly usable. It's just lacking. For example, if I'm in anything else and I was to go, oh, I would like, um, you know, I let, let's say, for example, this actually comes up a lot. Let's say that I am grabbing a torrent of something, some old movie or something. While I'm in there grabbing a torrent of a movie, I decide that I would like to be able to rename something I see that is problematic. Or I want to place that torrent in a new folder or whatever. <clears throat> One of the problems with all of the file browsers in Linux, whatever, they don't have the flexibility to do things like, for example, um, I, renaming folders may not be available depending on which one you end up landing on. You're renaming things while you're in there. You can't do a lot of the file browser functions 
when you're in the file chooser dialog. With File Explorer on Windows, almost all file chooser dialogs are fully functional Windows Explorer windows. So I can go into a folder, right click on something in that folder, while I'm choosing where I want to save or open something, I can right click on something else and say to open it. I can right click on some on a folder in a file picker and say open a new window and it'll pop a new explorer window that shows that folder in its own separate context. So I can go digging around in that folder freely, maximize it, whatever. I can actually use it as a standard explorer. If I can't do it in the file picker for some reason, or I don't, I don't want to, I can just open in a new window and boom. The shortcuts on the left in File Explorer. The shortcuts on the left are basically the same thing as a folder or file or whatever would be. Your quick access area, all those special shortcuts in quick access, they're treated largely like any other file or folder. Whatever you pin up there, whatever's you know in a recent area, whatever you see in the sidebar, it's all there and treated, for the most part, as much as it can be, like a normal file. Now, if you delete it, it deletes the shortcut link file, not your actual file that's being linked to, which is good. Um, but other things, for example, there's the, the folder tree in the left sidebar, I've found to be insanely useful, especially if you actually get things done with your computer. I found it insanely useful to be able to expand out. Two options in File Explorer that I always turn on are um, <coughs> expand to current folder and show all files and folders or show all folders, whatever it's called. Sorry guys, it's a like a 92 degree extremely humid day here in North Carolina and my throat is messed up. So apologize for all this coughing. <coughs> but <coughs> File Explorer, if I can avoid dying before finishing this video, File Explorer's left panel, the folder panel, is extremely useful because if you go to a folder, you can have it actually break out the folder tree to that folder, and it does so fairly quickly. You can't do that in a GTK file chooser. It's got a little clickable sort of substitute thing at the top that goes where the address bar would be in a Windows Explorer style file picker. But if you, you know, if you go up there, there's usually a button you can click to get a typable address bar. Um, and Windows sort of has a similar thing. Although you can just click up there in an empty area instead of having to target a button, which makes Windows win in that regard. Uh, but yeah, the, the left side, being able to expand to the current folder automatically is great. Um, the fact that it leaves those other folders that you've expanded, you, you can have those stay open. It doesn't auto-close anything. If you open a folder under a folder, it keeps that folder visible in the view even if you have the parent folder collapsed. So if you just visit a few folders underneath the folder, but you don't expand the folder in the folder sidebar, then it keeps them up. And remember, everything's treated like normal in the left, in the right, it doesn't matter. So you can right click a folder on the left panel and delete it or open it in a new window or whatever, drag it somewhere if that's what you want it to. You know, there, the, the flexibility and power of File Explorer in Windows is amazing. And Linux doesn't have anything equivalent. When I open a file picker in a Linux application, um, specifically a GTK one, um, I'm, I'm, I'm using Linux Mint Cinnamon, if you want reference, but when I open a file chooser dialog, I cannot get a thumbnail view. Why? Oh, why, for the love of God, can I not switch the view out of detail view in a file picker dialog? Like, oh, you, oh, you want to upload an image? Pick your image. I can't view the folder as a series of thumbnails. I have to go and open it manually somewhere else and look through the thumbnails that way. I can't right click it and say open a new window. 
to get a file thing to open the thumbnails in, I have to do something manually to be able to see those thumbnails. It's, it's absolutely infuriating. And I shouldn't have to do any of that. The, the, the file picker should have all the functionality of the file browser. There's no excuse for it. No excuse whatsoever. But I understand why it is that it's like that. Because GTK is a toolkit library. It is a toolkit for creating graphical applications. And that toolkit does not include a file browser. That's part of GNOME. That's not part of GTK. And therein lies the problem. The file chooser dialog is not the same thing as the file browser. It is limited because it's a limited portion of a toolkit. It is not meant to be a full-fledged file browser. Linux is what I would consider a very loosely integrated ad hoc system. To be completely frank, you're lucky when everything works the way that it's supposed to. Because every project has some other person working on it. In general, even the most organized, large, you know, collaborative Linux open source whatever projects have a tendency to not have a unifying, coherent vision. And even if they do, the people who work on GTK are not the people who work on the file stuff in GNOME or who work on the Cinnamon equivalent for Linux Mint. They're not the same people. And no matter what, there's such a heavy dependency on the GNOME components um, that assemble the GNOME file manager, which I think is Nautilus, and I think the Cinnamon one is Nemo. Uh, but there's all these massive dependencies that are not inherently required for GTK to work, in, you know, for its file picker. And that's basically it. The file picker is a completely separate program from any given file explorer. If you write a piece of software that is supposed to extend File Explorer, oh, I'm sorry, I mean Nautilus or Nemo, then what do you do if the, if the user uses Rocks Filer? What do you do if they're on KDE? Uh, what do you do if they're, if they're using something completely different? Well, there's your problem. You can't write an extension that say, um, one of the things I use on Windows, just as an example, <clears throat> I have, a program called Icaros, I-C-A-R-O-S, which is wonderful. It allows you to thumbnail and property sheet all sorts of media formats that are not supported even in the most recent updates to Windows 10 File Explorer. Um, Windows 10 File Explorer, if I recall correctly, can only understand a subset of the information about a Matroska video container. So you can't extract a whole bunch of things. You can't sort by a whole bunch of things that are in there. But if I go into um, Nautilus or Nemo or whatever other file browser on Linux, um, does it have that functionality? Does it, does it let me sort by the audio bit rate? Does it let me sort by the total bit rate? Does it let me sort by the frame height? Does it let me sort by the duration of the video or audio? <clears throat> These actually are critical functions for me in Windows and I find them extremely lacking in Linux file browsers. And even worse, I cannot get that functionality even if it's in the file browser of choice. The file picker is not the file browser of choice. So if, if it works in the file browser, well, I don't have that in the file picker. But on Windows, I do. On Windows, you can extend Explorer's capability to understand properties for files such that you can sort by whatever weird thing is exposed as a property sheet property by an extension that you hook into Windows Explorer. So Icaros can thumbnail videos that Windows doesn't know how to play at all in, in any way. <clears throat> it can thumbnail, you know, whatever weirdo format FFmpeg supports, and it can property sheet almost everything that FFprobe would tell you about that video or audio file. And File Explorer, via the Icaros extension that does the thumbnailing, File Explorer also 
can take those property sheet properties, extract them from the file. <clears throat> it basically calls a, a helper using DLL host and that extracts the information from the file about those properties, which it can then use to sort based on that. I cannot tell you how many times I've managed to find tons of duplicate videos that are not 100% duplicate, so my JDupes duplicate scanner doesn't find them, but I can tell they're duplicate because I sort every video in a folder by the video duration, which is how long the video plays. You would think you'd sort by length, um, actually, I think it is length. Yeah, I'm losing it, man. But <clears throat> I'll sort by length and use large thumbnails, maximize the file explorer window, and boom, every video that is like slightly tweaked metadata, but otherwise the same, every video that is a completely different resolution copy of the exact same or very similar thing is gonna be there side by side based on the length with perhaps slightly different thumbnails that you can still visually see are part of the same video. The same aesthetic, you know, the same general stuff in that frame area, whatever. And it, I've managed to pick things that duplicate scanners would never find simply by sorting by length and popping thumbnails. I cannot do that on Linux. So you want to know why I can't move to Linux? It's not just that Premiere, my video editor of choice, is not available there and doesn't run under Wine there. You know, it's not just that all these other programs don't run on it, um, but it, it's not just the packaging, which I've complained about in another video. It's that I can't do something that I consider to be as simple as sorting videos by the length of the video in a file explorer window. I can't do that in a file picker the file picker is extremely limited, so the file pickers on Linux are almost useless to me. I have to manually go dig it up myself. I shouldn't have to do that. There's so many things that Windows does so much better than Linux. And for all the crap that I give Microsoft and Windows, there are some things that they just objectively do better making it possible to create a compact system is not one of them, but, but ignoring that, <clears throat> you know, ignoring all the bloat, when we look at a tool like Windows File Explorer and the file picker dialogues that spawn from it, by the way, there's like three or four different file pickers on Windows, but even the older compatibility ones, though lacking in the sidebar functionality, they still our Windows Explorer subframes for the actual file part. So except for the weird ones that are like Windows 3.1 style, just but almost nothing uses that anymore. Um, there are some infuriating things about there being like four different file pickers on Windows, but I'm not gonna get too deep into those weeds. The bottom line is that the file picker that is the default and that most things on Windows, the vast majority of things on Windows use, is a good file picker that has all of the same functionality as File Explorer. And you can kind of use this as an analog for the rest of what I want to talk about here. Windows Explorer, for all its faults, for all the glitchiness or weirdness or stupid UI decisions that they've made over the years has all of these capabilities that make it easier to get things done that you want to do with it. They can put things in ribbons and tabs and, you know, others, you know, they space stuff out, which is stupid, the way that they space stuff out in Windows 11, the inconsistency in, in type sizes and things like that. You know, there are a lot of things that are wrong. But if I go to Linux, I know that I'm not going to be able to do something as simple as sort my files by length and show them in large thumbnails. I know that I'm not going to be able to do that in a file picker. I know that I'm not going to have any of that functionality. And then some nerd, weirdo, you know, techno weenie in the comments is going to be like, oh, we'll just do this and this and this and this and this. And it's always going to be something stupid like, Oh, we'll just write a one-line script that runs FF probe and it does, you know, and like makes a, a folder full of symbolic links or some crap, or 
You know, somebody will have some dumb solution to show me all that stuff or have me run some specialty program. I shouldn't have to do that. Why should I have to do that? All I have to do is install Icaros. I don't even have to do that. Uh, for video formats that Windows has built in codecs and File Explorer, or available in File Explorer 4, I don't even have to do that. You know, it, it can thumbnail everything. Um, or almost everything without Icaros, but with Icaros, it thumbnails every video format that I could imagine. It thumbnails every image format that I could imagine. It adds property sheet properties for almost everything that I would ever care about with audio and video and all of that. So if all of that stuff is available in Windows and, and I don't have to switch to some special program, all right, some stupid script that manufactures a folder for me to look at, long and it's just, I shouldn't have to do any of that. And the fact that somebody will pop up and say to me, oh, just do this more complicated thing, that that's the response to my complaint. Oh, you can do this complex thing or this tedious thing and it solves your problem. Why aren't you moving to Linux, bro? Well, because it doesn't solve my problem. See, this is one of the issues with the kind of people who create Linux software. If I can do it easier with some other piece of software on Windows, if I can do it easier in Windows, why would I come to Linux and lose that functionality and, and have a harder time of doing it? <sighs> because nerds get obsessed with like, oh, I, I wanna make this look cool, or I, I, oh look, I made this 20% faster or whatever, uh, or, oh, I integrated this with that, but your file browser still doesn't let me sort videos by, by, their, uh, by their length or whatever, you know? And, and maybe, um, maybe it's a different version. Maybe, maybe they do allow that now. Maybe they don't. I, it's been a while since I've had to deal with that. Maybe there's functionality there today that I'm just not aware of or that my permanently outdated Linux Mint 21.3, which is based on Debian Stable, which is always years out of date. Maybe there's something there that I'm just not aware of. But if they fix the thing where you can't sort videos by their duration, just as an example, that's not the problem. That's, the, that's a symptom of the problem. That's a Band-Aid on the chainsaw wound. That is not a solution because the actual problem is that the functionality is not there in the first place and things don't hook into that in a standard way in the first place. That You can't add that functionality in a standard way in the first place. And even if you did, nobody's done it. It's just, oh, you know, it, it, we'll lean on GStreamer or whatever, which leans on FFmpeg and hope for the best. And if that doesn't, that doesn't support it, well, just wait for it to support it, bro. That, that's, that's a solution. Just wait for it to support it. It'll be fine. Just wait. No, I don't want to wait because this is the problem. This is the problem with dealing with techno weenies and nerds that don't take the time to actually understand things. This is the problem when you don't have a unified vision for a system, when you don't have a system that is tightly integrated and that has to work together when you don't have one way of doing things, when the people who make the file manager are not, that are, are at a major disconnect with the people who actually, you know, get things done. That's where the problem lies. Things on Linux are thrown together. Their pet projects or their projects with a bunch of people that they, they, they'll do all this work on all these things, but they don't address fundamental issues fundamentally missing features, things that Windows has that Linux doesn't and won't. So I've gone on for a while, uh, according to my camera, which is probably not correct to be completely honest. Well, I don't know because yeah, 28 minutes, there you go. So it's been 28 minutes of raw footage and I still don't feel like I've expressed the crux of my issue here. Sorry about that, had to take a little road rage break from Roland Rambles. So, what we were talking about was the unification of the system, being under one unified vision with few ways of doing things. Because when you have few ways of doing things, 
you can focus on getting those things right. And I feel like that is what Windows has gotten right over the years. I don't know about Windows 3.1's file browser and program manager, but I know that extensibility has been built into the File Explorer system, well, back in the day it was Windows Explorer, since, probably since Windows 95, really. So now that we've gone through the discussion about all this File Explorer stuff and the big examples of how Windows does things better than other systems because it has a minimal unified vision for things and you don't have this fragmentation across a wide variety of small pet projects. Let me introduce you, if you haven't already heard of it, to the concept of technical debt. What is technical debt? That is when you make decisions early on that affect everything down the line exponentially. And here's an example. On my probably rarely read J Dupes blog, jdupes.com slash articles, I think it is, <clears throat> I have an article called Bring Back, uh, Bring Back Struct Durant, which is directory entry, um, and the uh, sub-item D underscore Namlen. What this cryptic sounding thing is, <laughs> it's going to sound petty, like why do you need it? Uh, but it's the name length of a directory entry item. So in C, in C programming, when you want to read a directory, you call a call called read dir, which means read directory. And each call to read dir returns the next directory entry, or durint. So when you get a directory entry, it has certain things that are part of it. This is, there is a structure that is returned by the calls to read dir that makes up a durint. And the only one that's strictly required is the name of the file that you're reading out of the directory, or the name of the next item. So in a durint, you have a name, and then you have a lot of other things. These things include um, something called a record length on Linux in particular. There's D underscore reclen for record length, which is just supposed to be the size of that directory entry, um, basically the size and memory of the entire returned directory entry structure, which includes the name. The name is tacked on the end, so there is a convoluted way that involves some you know, programmatic math to get the name length out of the record length. It is um, a little wishy-washy. It, it is not perfect. I have written code to do it. Um, you have other things like um, some, some BSD systems and QNX actually return a name length. So you do have the ability to find the name, the length of the file name um, directly from the directory entry. There are, um, there's a type that some systems return, which Linux often uses to tell you, like uh, in the directory entry, so you don't have to stat the file, which is how you get detailed information. Um, in the directory entry, that this is a directory, or this is a special, this is a block device, or whatever. Um, and then there's a type unknown, which just means we don't have that information. So these various things, when you are reading a directory, say you got a, just a folder with file one, two, and three in it, um, you get one, and it, and it tells you, you know, let's assume it's the words, O-N-E, and that's the full name of the file, one. Um, the entry is going to tell you that it's a normal file. It's like, it's like DT underscore normal or something. That would, is what would be in the D type. But then, then you're going to take that, and probably somewhere in your code, you're going to grab the name, which is tacked onto the end, which can be the length. It's the length of the name, O-N-E, followed by a terminating null. So, um, but the length in characters is three, O-N-E, one, two, three. Um, the next one, two, T-W-O. The next one, T-H-R-E-E. -E. That one's going to be five instead of three because it's five characters. A lot of programs need to know this value. In fact, almost all of them that read a directory are going to do something with the name that they read from the directory. It is extremely common for a program that is reading a directory entry to take that name and copy it somewhere else. When you copy a string of text, this is often done with a string copy function. 
Now, the problem is how a string copy fun function works is it starts at the first character, it copies that character to the other place that it's supposed to go to, and then it keeps going. Next character, next character, next character, until it hits a null terminator character. The null terminator character is how string copy knows it's at the end. It's just a zero, it's, it's a literal zero, not the character code for zero, which I can't remember, but it's, it's like 33 or something, I don't know. Um, maybe it's like 60, whatever. But the character code for zero is not zero. Um, it's a literal zero, not the thing that means the, the alphanumeric character zero. <clears throat> so when it hits this zero value, it knows it's done. But this means that anywhere in whatever chunk of memory this thing is set up in, anywhere in there, um, there could be a zero. So you can't just grab four bytes at a time, which is what 32-bit computers can do, is grab four bytes, which is 32 bits at a time, and copy that. You can't grab eight bytes at a time, like on a 64-bit machine, and copy that. You can't grab 16 bytes, which is SSE, which is something that all 64-bit machines support, and copy that. You can't grab 32 bytes at a time, which AVX, AVX 256 can copy 32 bytes at a time. You can't do these bigger grabs and moves because you don't know the length yet. Now, here's the problem. If you run string length, S-T-R-L-E-N, and you get that string length, well, guess what it does? It reads each character to see if there's a zero there, and if there's not a zero there, then it adds one to a counter. It literally counts them one by one, and at that point, you're better off just going ahead and copying it and not caring about the length. But if you already know the length, if you know the length in advance, guess what you can do? You can use a memory copy function a memory copy function that's optimized to copy in larger chunks until it can't anymore. So say you've got a file name that is, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I can't count that quickly, but let's say you've got a file name that's like tacosandburritos.txt. And I'm sure that's at least 16 characters, right? So you want to copy the name tacosandburritos.txt somewhere else. Um, it's at least 16 characters. So what a smart file copy function will do, generally speaking, is it will grab, if it knows the length, hey, you've got a protected green, my brother. It, if it knows the length of the string, it, it can just, you can use memcopy, which copies eight bytes at a time or 16 bytes at a time on modern machines which basically means most of the file gets copied, or most of the, the string of text gets copied by grabbing one chunk, putting that chunk, you're done. And then there's the tail, which is however many. But the point is, the machine can grab big pieces at a time and forcing it to go ding, 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 one individual character at a time is slow. Grabbing a big piece is fast. You just skipped 15 individual character pick and pull, pick and pull, you skipped 15 of those counts by doing it in one big chunk and then just adding 16 to the counter. Some of my more astute viewers will probably have noticed that I changed a bit here. So what's happened is I actually rambled too long about that subject and I had to do a cut and continue after I did the other stuff that I'm doing. Basically, I went swimming for a while, and now I'm done. So woohoo, yay me, yay. <clears throat> so back to what we were discussing. We were talking about the string copy thing and uh, how if you have the length of the name of a file, you can do more efficient copies by doing a memory copy since the length is known instead of a string copy where the length is unknown and you have to basically um, check character by character instead of large chunk by large chunk. Basically, um, instead of copying eight things at a time or 16 things at a time, you have to copy one at a time and do a check. So copy, check, copy, check, copy, check, instead of just copy, 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 and that's the end of it. Now, the reason that this matters is that, <clears throat> that you, you cannot do a string copy without repeating 
the effort that would be done with a string length check. So yes, you could do a string length check and then do a copy, which does the more efficient copy. The problem is when you do that, you're still having to read and compare. The only difference is you're not writing to the other location. But now you're reading the same data twice. Maybe it's faster due to caching, maybe not. It kind of depends because, you know, with enough, uh, enough text, you're gonna start evicting some cache lines anyway. So you're better off if you can get that length from something that already knows it, then you avoid duplicating that effort. And that's pretty much what I'm trying to hammer home here. Sorry, the, uh, the brightness out here keeps changing. There we go. So what I'm trying to hammer home is that this, this seemingly inconsequential thing, this, this name length, it shouldn't matter all that much, but it matters quite a bit. It matters because you're repeating that effort. It doesn't matter for one, it doesn't matter for two, but if you have 10,000 files or 100,000 files, which is not unrealistic, there's actually a pretty good chance that uh, if you're doing any serious work, if, if you're doing enough work that it would matter, 100,000 files is not out of the question by any stretch of the imagination. It, it's, you know, let me give you an example. Um, I tend to run whole um, scrapes on pages to gather information. Um, I archive stuff, so if I scrape a web page, there may be literally hundreds of files per scrape. Repeat that for a thousand pages or, you know, spider links or whatever, you easily end up with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, several hundred thousand um, pieces of uh, files that you, you're storing and you're deduplicating and all this stuff, whatever, but the bottom line is that the every file creates an entry. Every entry, <laughs> every entry has to go somewhere and every entry has to be worked with every time you mess with things. <clears throat> so, as it often is with programming, you, you can't, you cannot do this, the, um, if you have all this stuff, it's like you have to repeat the effort every time you redo stuff, but repeating efforts what cost time. Now, every operating system knows the length of the names that are underneath it. So when I've actually confirmed this and it's in my article on this subject, the, uh, every operating system has the length of the file name under the hood. Every single one. Windows, um, I don't have access to source code to prove it, but Windows does have functions that, um, or rather the specification for a file object in Windows has the length of the name in the specification. So Windows, any file object under the hood in Windows has the length of the name attached to it. Um, and this is like in the driver programming stuff. This is not some kind of like, you know, like the add-on library that does the math and hands it to you like mine does. This is where under the hood, the actual like low level, driver level, you know, object that gets passed around already knows the length. But there's no application programming interface or API to kick that length back up to a program. So the OS knows that this file name is 36 characters long. Um, same thing with the case of Linux or any other OS. They know that it's 36 characters long, bytes if you will, 36 bytes long. And when they hand off the file information, they hand us a string with the name terminated with a null character. What they do not hand us is the length, unless you're on a BSD or QNX, which means Mac OS does directly do that, FreeBSD does, um, and so on. But the majority of systems do not give you the length, they just give you the string, and if you need the length, you have to do something that counts up the length again, that duplicates that effort. So it, it's very annoying um, to know that it's there. And, you know, it, like I say, it makes a big difference when you're working with um, when you're working with this stuff under the hood, um, 
and you're you're talking like a hundred thousand files and each one let's say each one is an average of 16 characters long um, just just for fun so that's 16,000 characters but technically um, I'm sorry that's 1.6 million characters so 1.6 million characters for um, 16 byte names and 100,000 files. So let's do a little bit more back of the envelope math here. We need another one because there's technically 17 characters, not 16, because the null terminator is actually part of the string. So we need 1.7 million operations of read the character, check to see if it's a zero byte, and then write the character. That's 1.7 million of them. Whereas if we already have the length, and we can't avoid it because it's a string, there are some functions, um, there are some things that can be used in newer assembly language. There's some stuff to accelerate the process. Um, but in general, that's what you're up against. You still have to um, set up all kinds of stuff to, to work nicely with that is, is the problem. But just on our naive implementation, 1.7 million uh, read, check, write operations. So that's uh, 17, 34, 51, um, 5.1 million operations. Read, check, and copy. Right? Read, check, copy. 5.1 million of them. So if we're doing 5.1 million of these, and we can get rid of that, and instead, how many did we say? 16? Well, let's just assume a 64-bit machine, uh, which is 8 bytes, and no SSE or AVX acceleration, just straight 64-bit assembly, you know, memory copy. So that's read 8 bytes, write 8 bytes, read 8 bytes, write 8 bytes. So that's four operations per file name. That's four total operations per file name. That means to copy the name from one to the other is four. Technically there's a null terminator, so we need to count that too, and that's one last byte to either be copied or we can just write it. We don't actually have to copy it. We can just write it without reading it. So we write a zero at the tail end, um, but that's, so that's three, one, two, three, four, five operations. So that's 500,000 operations versus 5.1 million. Um, ignoring some of the nitty gritty details because, you know, touching 8-bit bytes is a different speed than touching 64-bit in some cases. Ignoring those weird corner cases and just generalizing. If we have 100,000 files with 16-byte names, and we are going to read those names and then copy those names into some other buffer. That is 10 times less operations. It's more than 10 times less operations. A literal order of magnitude faster. Which means, again, ignoring things like caching, which means that it takes place in one-tenth of the time. So if it would cost five seconds for the computer to process, to go through that process for 100,000 files, it now takes 0.5 seconds. All because you knew the name length. But Jody, this is a lot of mumbo jumbo in the technical weeds. You're getting really crazy with all the math and junk here and I'm still not seeing the connection. What does this have to do with File Explorer? What does this have to do with the whole unified vision, Linux is dead, blah, 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 that you clickbaited our sorry butts into actually listening to you for over an hour about? Well, we are at that point, dear viewer. The problem is that back in the day, in 1995, this is also detailed in my article, by the way, in 1995, Linus Torvalds said that the, he wants DNAMLIN to go away because nothing in certain things, it's not in POSIX, it's not in System V Revision 4, so anything that has it is just broken. It's, it's broken because it's not in the POSIX spec and it's not used by System 5 Unix. <coughs> Release 4. 
This is his logic in 1995. He said, name length isn't in the standards, so anything using it's just broken. Now keep in mind it's in BSD. BSD uses it. But System V, System 5, and POSIX, which is the spec that Linux tries to live by primarily, and technically the single Unix specification that succeeded all this stuff too, um, it's not in any of those, but the thing is, there are a lot of things that aren't in those that Linux still returns. And what, what Torvald said is doing the record length makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it, it, the way that he worded it, it was very short, and I'm basically trying to take a lot of meaning out of a pretty short piece of text. It's like one paragraph. He said that record length makes a lot more sense, and, you know, that's, so that's what we pass to user space. But name length, oh, no, no, name length... That's not in the in the standard, so I don't. I, that, that shouldn't be there. The problem is to calculate the record length. What I had to do in in practical terms, I have written <clears throat> a piece of code that takes the record length and it calculates out the name length from it without wasting a bunch of time, basically, so that it doesn't have to do string length. Basically, what it does. My code takes record length, calculates the offset, the, the offset to the start of the name, but I figured out that the record length, there's something about it that is not actually accurate. And uh, so the record length only let me calculate up to a certain point. Then I had to redo basically the work of string length. I was able to basically chop off a four byte section and then every successive eight byte section. But there's some sort of error or just there's something in the record length that is wrong. The record length is like the, um, it, it's aligned to the ending of the actual allocation instead of being aligned to the ending of the name, which is what you would expect it to be. And so I have to still do the string length stuff for the very end of it. So no, record length does not actually help as much as you would think. Um, in fact, I have looked and I don't think, I, I grepped a whole bunch of source code. I don't think anything, anything uses the record length that's handed by, down by the Linux kernel and comes through the libc API. I, I haven't seen a single program that actually makes use of it until my library uses it as a way to halfway shortcut calculating name length. So it's real disappointing to look at this stuff and realize this. So uh, let me tie it all up for you. Let me put, put the bow on all of this. We were talking about technical debt, about how if you make decisions early on, those decisions become exponentially um, involved in the foundation of the project. <clears throat> in 1995, Torvalds basically made a decision that name length shouldn't be there, record length should be there. Now, what would we need to do at a minimum to get name length back in there? Well, let's talk about that real fast. First of all, just a, a less important aspect of this <clears throat> is that adding name length breaks the API. So if you have the name length added, now the structure size or layout changes. Now your directory entry structure has another element, which means all the offsets that every program compiled up to that point was built to work with are messed up. And if you're adding name length and leaving record length, you're also increasing the size of the structure, which means the structure is now, um, because the size has increased by another element, every single directory entry that you store somewhere, that you store the data for somewhere, is now going to be bigger, which means blowing out more cache lines, using up more memory, and so on you are making the structure bigger, which means you're making the program slower and less efficient. All programs, because every program uses this. If it reads a directory, it probably uses this. And um, calls like FileTreeWalk, um, FTW or NFTW, 
the POSIX calls that are supposed to do it better. <clears throat> I looked into them. Um, they don't actually do it better. Um, you are actually better off just, just using the standard directory read. But here, here's the problem. Like I say, everything compiled to that point breaks. So now you've got to do some sort of compatibility BS where if it was built with like, you know, glibc, for example, has the ability to do this. But um, the problem is it's not just the programs now, it's also the kernel itself. So the kernel is compiled with a certain interface um, because it has to pass the name length somewhere. But it doesn't. It passes record length, and that's it. It does not pass name length. Ergo, you can't add it without breaking the kernel API, which breaks the C library and anything that calls the kernel API directly. So all of that has to be recompiled at a minimum, possibly edited. Um, then, if the kernel's not, if the kernel's passing this new thing, you have to make the C library aware of it, which glibc actually already has the capability if it's available, but it's not quite that simple. So we're talking basically, you have to change the way the kernel works so that it adds that to what gets passed in the call, which means adding it to all the structures that it passes around that have that record length. It's got to have the name length too. So you've got a kernel API break or ABI. Technically, it's ABI. It's the binary interface. It breaks both the AB, it breaks the ABI, but not the API. So the kernel ABI breaks, and now everything has to be rebuilt for the new kernel ABI. Which means, at a minimum, the C library has to be modified and re rebuilt. Then. If there is a program, um, if any program that was built with the C library that is not the one you modified, thanks, Fairy, um, that program now has to be rebuilt. Everything has to be rebuilt so that it speaks the new one. If we, if we want to make this change where we pass the name length up, we have to rebuild, rewrite the kernel ABI to carry it, which means all the kernel structures rewrite the C library to talk the kernel ABI correctly, rewrite the, A the API that the C library presents to programs to include it, recompile all programs so that they don't misunderstand the directory entry element in that structure and uh, not work, basically. It'll break every piece of software. Uh, if it's closed source software, it just won't work. Um, there are ways to mitigate this. We could, we can write a compatibility shim that provides the old API to user space, unless they have like a symbol that indicates that they meet the new API. So there are ways to mitigate that and uh, make things continue to work that were built with the old one. But ideally, you want to rebuild with the new one. And truth be told, ideally, you want to get rid of the record length entirely and just 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 not use it. The whole D rec len thing is stupid. Nobody uses it. Get rid of it. Throw it away and replace it with name length. Now, um, basically, you can see that you have to, at a minimum, rebuild the kernel, uh, re rewrite portions of the kernel and rebuild it. Rewrite portions of the C library and rebuild it, and write a compatibility shim at a minimum so that your software, all of it, doesn't just magically break. Now you have two different APIs to deal with, too. And uh, that means that the old stuff doesn't go all the way away. But you can calculate record length um, out of the name length. I mean, there are some tricks you can use to optimize this. So I've told you all this technical crap and all this labor you'd have to go through to make this happen. This is the problem with technical debt. Had Linus Torvalds just not done the record length thing and just done the name length thing from the get-go and, and not been an ignorant fool about it back in the mid-90s, which admittedly, you know, he, Linux was three or four years old, but hey, we all make mistakes when we're in our 20s, right? So had he not made this one fundamental error in judgment, Linux would be able to pass the name length 
from, that it already knows by the way, I actually tracked down the exact structure in the kernel where it has a, a, a name length and a hash for every file name that floats around in the file system layer. It has a name length and a hash, which means it knows the length of it. It could easily pass it if it was just told to do so, but it does not do it. Had he not made that choice, we would have the speed benefits of the lengths of names being known, being passable to user space, which means that the string length is only calculated one time in kernel, already done that labor because it has to, to do what it does. It has to calculate the string length to do what it does anyway. So if it already has to do the work, then why in the hell not just pass the work on so that it's not repeated? Because you'd have to do all that stuff I just said to pay off the interest that that technical debt has incurred over time. It's brutal and it's a lot of work and it's frankly a little bit beyond me, although I gotta be honest, I am just a little bit interested in at least giving it a shot, but it only helps in the case that you're reading directories and you use the name length. And part of the problem is that user space software, and this is where it gets even worse, user space software will also have to be not rewritten, um, but you have to add the ability for user space software to see, oh, this, um, this version of the C library API we're compiling against supports the name length. <clears throat> well, if that's the case, then internally we can just use the name length that's handed to us instead of using the record length or just doing string lengths all by ourselves over and over again. You'd have to go to software and do that. I've actually been working on doing this for BusyBox, which is a popular um, embedded all-in-one sort of utility. And um, my, my code that speeds it up just using the record length calculation, the, um, the speed ups can be pretty big, especially in the find command. The speed ups are massive. Um, just to give you an idea, um, and that's using record length. That's still doing some work. That's still calculating an offset, um, finding a starting point and running a partial string length on the tail end to find the total length. So that's still doing a little bit of work. It's still way faster. And I mean way, way faster. Um, I'd have to go look at the specifics because I don't remember how much faster, but it was big enough that I submitted it to the mailing list. Unfortunately, it's nigh on impossible to get anything in BusyBox nowadays because everybody just ignores your patches. It, it's very frustrating. But anyway, um, the bottom line is that while this could speed things up, it's not gonna happen without a massive amount of work that nobody wants to take on. There's no glory in it. Um, there's no glory in it until it's done. And you're talking about sticking your finger in literally hundreds of open source projects to make this performance boost. And, you're talking, especially with smaller directories, like with your home directory, oh, you've got 50 files and folders in it. Just as an example, you know, it, you don't use your, your Linux installation for much, just maybe some web browsing. And your home directory's got 50 items and you open a file chooser. Well, the file chooser is gonna kick strings around. And if those strings in your home folder, you know, they're, if they're not very long, then the string length calculation doesn't take very long anyway. So you're only milking a little bit of a benefit out of it. But this is the thing is that depending on how much, um, how often these string lengths get recalculated, you know, how much you're moving around, the optimization may not be much. But if the optimization happens and gets kicked around to all the layers and a lot of redundant string length things are removed as a result, then what you see is while one change may make such a negligible difference that you can barely see it in a benchmark of millions of files, just whatever, um, one change may make no difference. <clears throat> the combined set of changes, like changing it in a lot of software, makes all of that software 
just a little tiny sliver more efficient. And the end result, wow, that guy's going real fucking fast. Oof. And the end result is that the whole system becomes more efficient um, and, it, and it sort of adds together. I mean, if you have one, pro if you have a bunch of programs that are poking around in directories or whatever, and the read directory thing is uh, they avoid one string length every time they do it, even just one, that's that much less CPU time being used. And it, that those shavings can add up to a pretty decent boost in speed, reduction in latency to respond to events, you know, but it's not the kind of thing that is glamorous. It requires a lot of this esoteric knowledge to make it happen, and it'll be a lot of work to do it. Whereas if, if it was done in 1995, and they accepted the pain back when the system was young, and, you know, Apache was still fairly fresh on the scene, whatever, if they had went ahead and taken care of this back then, then this wouldn't be an issue. We would already be reaping the benefits, and that's it. This is just one item. This is one single, highly technical, not necessarily always a big improvement thing. And because of the way it was impl implemented so long ago, we are still suffering under the inefficiency because it's too much work, and some people might argue it's not worth the work. So, you know, who's going to do that? And this is what, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons I say Linux is a dead end. It's not dead. It's useful. I love it. I use it on so many things, mostly servers. But Linux is an amazing system. It can run all over the place. You can do tons of crazy things with it. It does have a lot of utility. But as far as replacing my Windows 10 installation on my big bulky desktop, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen, and part of the reason it's not going to happen is because I do not think, having, having poked around with Linux since 1998, having seen KDE and GNOME and FVWM95 and all that back in the late 90s, and seeing where they are today, I have no faith that any of these things that make Windows better, that Linux will ever be able to find that. All of these projects are just, they're all broken by default. Not because they've done something horribly wrong, you know, not, not because, not because they're like run by idiots or that, you know, their goals are stupid or anything like that. Everybody could be the smartest person in the room wherever they go and it could still be bad. And the problem is that all of these systems were designed separately they were mushed together later, and nobody really put a lot of thought into what that should look like later. You know, nobody went to the GTK file picker and said, this should be a full File Explorer style interface, not a uh, partial, like, like just, just enough to go grab a file and be, you know, and be done with it. Nobody went in there thinking that it should be that and therefore it is not that. It's just enough that you can browse around a bit and find files to um, complete a demand for, hey, what file do you want to open? Or uh, what, what do you want to save here? That's all. That's all it's good for because that's all it was ever made to be good for. But nobody's ever going to fix it because now if you, if you want to take Nautilus or Nemo and you want to make that you want to basically make that the GTK file picker, you have to pull in all these GNOME dependencies just for GTK and the file picker. And, and that's the problem, you know, is they just, they, they, nobody's ever going to do it. Nobody's going to do it. That's just, that's an amazing amount of work. It, it could break so many things. Can you imagine? There's like hundreds of things that you have to compile, hundreds of packages just to get a basic functional GNOME environment or Cinnamon environment. You know, even XFCE is is still like, I don't know, what is it, 30 or 40 packages just to get the, the XFCE environment going? I mean, it, it's not some small feat. And like I said, if you change the way that the GTK thing works, 
well, you know, now you're, you're technically making everything else that has to include it fatter. So now GIMP requires a bunch of GNOME components to function. You know, and I don't like that there's hundreds of components that make up this one program, but there you go. Nobody's going to do it. They're going to be like, oh, no, it's good enough. If you don't, if you don't like it, then you code it. You do it. If you, don't, if you think that this is so important, then you do it so we can reject your whatever you write because it doesn't meet this, that, or the other guideline, or, or we don't think that it's the direction we want to go. You know, you, oh, you did six months of work, but we're, we're not going to include your work in the project because uh, we know, why, why, why would be? Why would we do that? And that, that really is the underlying issue, is that just because it's something that should be done doesn't mean that they'll accept it. There's just all these layers of rejection. You know, I made J-Dupes because the F-Dupes maintainer, author, whatever, um, he, I sent him one patch that adds a delay to the print function for the progress so that it's not printing a whole new line every single time that a single file was touched, but instead it would wait 256 files. And over Secure Shell, it made a massive difference because it cut the amount of data being shuffled around to show progress indicators down to one 256th of the amount of data. And the guy just ignored me. And then I, and then I went in there and was like, okay, I see that he's using hashes as a way to quickly compare files. Why is he storing the hashes as strings of 16 byte, you know, MD5 hashes or whatever? Um, why is he storing them as 16 characters, like literal character strings, instead of their binary representations? Like, he's doing all this conversion and string checking when he could just be checking a couple numbers against each other. So, the question becomes, well, why are we doing it this way? Uh, let's not. Let's let's kick the binary version around. And it made a big speed difference. And he ignored me. And eventually, I forked it because I was pissed off that I was making very simple improvements that had massive speed gains and were very safe to make. And this guy was just ignoring me. I don't know why he was ignoring me. Maybe it was the whole not invented here problem where, oh, he doesn't get to take credit, so of course he won't let me. But I don't know. I don't know. I, I'll never know what the guy's motivations were for not accepting a single thing that I sent in. But that's why I had to fork it, and that's part of the problem. Is that even if someone did the work, it may not get accepted. And then you have another fork. And now, if you've seen the XKCD comic about you know, different solutions. It's like, situation, there are 16 different competing solutions. And someone says, why doesn't someone just write one solution that takes into account all the things for these others, the other ones that are already out there, and solves it all? And then the last panel is situation. There are 17 competing different solutions. And that's the problem. You fork gnome and you make cinnamon, or you fork cinnamon and make, I don't friggin' know, nutmeg, you know, because project maintainers won't accept your, you know, massive invasive rewrite of whatever. Oh, it's too much trouble, let's not bother, you know, whatever. So you make your own with blackjack and hookers. Now there are three versions of the same file management, whatever, toolkit, this, that, and the other floating around out there. Three completely different incompatible versions that do that do mostly the same thing, but one's better than the other for this reason. The other's better than the other for that reason. And that's the story of Linux. And more broadly, that's the story of most open source operating systems. So my, my conclusion on this is I decided that if I were to write a new operating system from scratch that learns from all of these massive technical debt mistakes, what would I do? <clears throat> I don't think I would make it open source. I think what I would do is I would make it source available. I think I would accept patches, but I think that I would 
license it out such that while it might be source available, while you might be able to write things that work with it, that you can't alter the fundamental functionality of it. Because what I would be afraid of is that something that's in my software, someone else writes a tool that's similar but not the same to do basically retreading the old ground. And now we have two competing solutions. And someone else writes one, now we have three. And, it, and that's the thing, like on Linux, you know, you've got F dupes, you got J dupes, you got RM lint, you got dupe remove, uh, you got F clones. There's all these duplicate scanners out there. And ultimately, they all kind of sort of do the exact same thing. It's a bunch, it, it's just, there's a lot of labor that's wasted on this. And the, like, even just the incompatibilities between F dupes and J dupes, just look at that. Like, some of the things have different meanings between them, so you can't just drop mine into a script for his. At some point, I had to diverge and say, look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not supporting this anymore. Like, one of his stupid, brain-dead, moron decisions was to make it so that files that are zero length count as duplicates by default. Empty files count as duplicates by default. They're empty files, dude. They're not taking up any space. They have no data. And there may be a reason that the empty file is there. You don't just nuke empty files because all of them are duplicates. You, you know, that's stupid. This is so stupid. So I made zero length files something you have to explicitly ask for because I thought that was stupid. And I didn't want my system to be stupid. But this is the problem is that if the system was written the right way in the first place, then that really stupid decision would never have happened. And if I write a system, and I am the benevolent dictator for life of that system, and I do it right from the get-go, I don't want someone else coming in and going, oh, well, yeah, I, I, you know, what you did is cool, but I want to write a different file manager for it. No, you don't get to write a different file manager for it. The file manager that's in the system is the file manager that's in the system. And that's the end of it. There are no more file managers in the system. You're not going to write a Cinnamon, Nemo, whatever. You know, you're not going to do that to me. You're not going to take my system and write an incompatible file explorer. And okay, you think that yours is better than mine. That's fine and great. But the bottom line is I don't want you to be able to do that. If you want to write your own stupid thing, well, I want my license to say, if you write an application that reduplicates the effort of one that I've already got as one of the blessed core system applications, then you cannot distribute it to anyone. Because I would not want to write a file explorer like Windows with the features that should be there, with things set up the way they should be, and then have someone else come along and write a file manager that, like, say, looks cooler or has this one extra feature but is grossly incompatible and now programs have to decide between file manager blessed by OS guy and file manager that you know homie boy 679 over here has written um, that some people prefer over the core file manager and you, just, you get the ideas like you can't write for three or four file managers if I write a file manager for my operating system I don't want you to also write a file manager for it. And I would want to keep it that way until the system was developed enough that there, any other file manager that was written to replace mine would have to provide such a compelling case to break that compatibility that it made sense to ditch mine for theirs. It effectively would have to completely replace it. You know, and that's the problem is with open source, people love doing shit like that. That they, they, they practically live to do shit like that. that. That's part of the reason open source is so nice. But I would not want that to happen. I would be deathly afraid that anything I would do correctly, some jackass would come through and say, oh, I wanted to have this, so I'm going to write it myself. Listen, JDupes, back when I had the issue trackers and pull requests activated so people could actually submit code changes, I ended up rejecting about, I'd say, 80 to 90 percent of the pull requests that were sent in. 
<clears throat> and it was mostly because these people would do these, they would make these pull requests to add features or change things or whatever, but they wouldn't understand what they were changing. They, they sort of like, they didn't know what they were doing, and it's not necessarily their fault, but they'd sort of cargo cult programmer. If you don't know what that means, it basically means that it they think it's magic, um, and they try to emulate the things that uh, they think bring them the magic around. But it's like a cargo cult programmer thing, where they naively implement something by breaking a bunch of other shit. It's like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a round window in by taking a hammer and meticulously smashing the existing window so that there's a, a circle-shaped hole the right size to put this circular window in the broken window. That's kind of how it is, and, and that's the problem. That's one of the biggest problems with open source software and with free systems like Linux and BSD and all of it is that anybody can come in and try to smash the window and put a circular window and be like, hey, hey, replace everyone's window with a circle window in smashed rectangular window because it solves my one use case, works fine on my machine for my use case. So do that for everyone. And they don't know that they're stupid. They don't know that their idea is stupid. Um, you have to be like old school pissy Linus Torvalds to scare people like that off by forcing them to very aggressively defend their probably shit rationale for things. You have to be a douchebag. Otherwise, they'll run right over you and your projects. But anyway, the bottom line. Linux is a dead end. Linux is a dead end because you cannot go back and undo all the technical debt, and you cannot get rid of the one billion competing solutions that all overlap a whole lot of the same ground while missing a lot of the same extremely important, in my opinion, features and functionality. You just can't do it. You can't unwind that debt. You can't unring the bell. We're so far. We're what? Um, line, let's see. Linux was released to a mailing list in 91, but really picked up in 92. Uh, it's currently 2024. So that means one, two, that's 32 years of Linux development and software surrounding it. KDE, GNOME, all of that, probably late, high 20s. Um, nobody's going to bail on that much code development that easily. Jesus, my phone is going crazy. I guess that's my sign to stop chattering my mouth. But I feel like Linux is a dead end and needs to be replaced with something new. Something that dumps the technical debt. Um, but as, as is always the case, you know, um, things like the massive existing install base of software will always be an issue. And I feel like one of the reasons Mac OS works is because even though they, you know, yanked, like, I think L4 as a microkernel, or XNU um, as a microkernel, and then um, they built Darwin as a BSD on top of it, the reason that that worked, A, is because Apple has tons of money and resources to put behind it, B, they had an existing user base, C, they used an emulator called Rosetta to get people moved from the old Mac OS to the new Mac OS, while, and making their applications still work, albeit emulated, <clears throat> but they worked. So there was a lot of transitional stuff. Plus, when they built the new system, <laughs> they rebuilt it with the intention of building it right and throwing away a lot of the problems with their old one. And you'll find a lot of people who love Linux or BSD, whatever, that are actually like, Mac OS is the best Linux. Well, it's not Linux, but Hear me out. It's the best Unix because, or Unix-like, because Mac OS was built from the ground up much later than most Unix-like systems, and it dropped a lot of the trash, and built its its own, learned from the mistakes of the past. We need something like that for general purpose computing, not just for Macs, not under the fist of Apple, not some half-ass open source trash fire that like open Darwin or whatever that can't actually be used as a real open source system anyway. You know, we need a new operating system to compete with Mac OS and Windows and Linux and BSD and to learn from all of the mistakes of all of them. And uh, I guess that's where I'm going to end it because I can't keep talking. God almighty, I've gone on way too long. 
you know the deal, like, comment, subscribe, and all that crap. I'm going to go get some chips. Good night. This truck is so annoying. My God, get some new brakes. What, what the hell is wrong with you? Get some new brakes. All right. So, <clears throat> let's see what happens now. Yeah, I would really like for that truck to not be anywhere near me. <sighs> Anybody who speeds up in a giant truck when they're like 500 feet from a red light and then brakes is not somebody that should be driving a commercial vehicle. That's pretty stupid. Speeding up to a red light full of cars. Yeah, don't make me a part of that, bro. Just don't. And the times are getting rolly. The times are getting rambly. Off we go to hell. And by hell, I mean wherever this car is going. I'm so glad you're probably looking at this instead of, uh, yeah. I hate this phone. Jesus. I hate this phone. Um, oh my God. Did it really just do that? Oh my God. Shh. Try to type yes. Hit the quick button for yes and it hits no. Touch screens are trash. I hate touch screens so much. Especially phone touch screens because you can't operate them one handed because they're too big. Bring back small phone touch screens. Jesus. Anyway. Issue here. Um, Don't flash at me, fucker. You want to flash lights at me, boy. I'm going to make sure you can't get over. This Rolled and Rambles was brought to you by people who flash me on the highway get what they fucking deserve. Oh no, not you. You don't get to come over. You definitely don't get to come over. Motherfucker, do it. See what happens. Do it. Do it. See what happens. 